I blinked open my eyes. Whoa, my head felt dizzy. And, er, why was I covered in scratches? My mind was totally blank. I couldn't remember what happened. The last picture flashing through my mind was a heated argument between me and some guy. Then I stormed off and, and now, here I am, in this gloomy place. I think it's a basement or something. It's cold, and it stinks of damp. Dang it! I cannot remember his face! I knew I needed to get out of here, and fast! I ran to the door and tried opening it, but to no avail. It's locked! I slammed my hands against the door and shouted, Anyone? Help! I could hear footsteps approaching, so ignoring my throbbing palms and burning throat, I banged on the door and screamed out, Open the door! Oh. My. God. It's him! The guy I'd been arguing with before! He was holding a sandwich and smiling gently at me. Oh, Alice, my puppy. Are you awake? I thought you might be hungry. Who are you? You brought me here, didn't you? What do you want? He looked confused, then sadly blurted out, Oh no, honey, you must have memory loss from the accident. It's your Josh here. I'm your boyfriend. I squinted at him. He did look familiar, but what boyfriend? What accident? He showed me the photos on his phone. O-M-G. That was me with him. And we looked so happy together. But why can't I remember anything? I hit my head with my hands in frustration, while Josh just stood there against the wall staring at me and giggling. So maybe this Josh guy was my boyfriend, but that didn't explain why he'd locked me up in this dungeon. This wasn't a normal boyfriend thing to do. I rushed to the door, but he grabbed me in his arms. Let me out! You definitely have some wicked intention going on bringing me here! I scowled. Oh my gosh, Alice, you've been watching too many movies. Do you really not remember anything? I gave him a clearly not look, then folded my arms. I guess the accident was pretty intense. We argued, then you insisted on driving while you were drunk, and then caused a fatal accident. Never mind. I think we shouldn't go in too deep about that right now. It must be traumatizing for you. But that's why I decided to bring you here. So the cops wouldn't arrest you. Wh- wh- what Why couldn't I remember such a horrible thing? But looking at all the wounds on my face and body, maybe everything was exactly like what Josh said. No, n- no! I- I- have to c- confess! I stuttered in tears. Are you crazy? Do you want to go to jail? But, but... Alice, no buts. I'm gonna protect you and keep you safe. This was a lot to process, so in a moment of panic, I found myself agreeing to his crazy plan. Josh said this was an emergency bunker back from his grandfather's time. Sure thing. I mean, it sure smelled musty. There's not even a window, just a flickering wall light. It felt like I was in a horror movie. Josh also told me that he'd taken my phone off me so the cops wouldn't be able to trace it and arrest us both. And that's it. Every morning, noon, and night, Josh would bring me food and talk to me about his day. Puppy, I'm home. Puppy? Oh, it sounded cute at first, but I soon became allergic to that word. Hey, puppy, eat this. Puppy this, puppy that. Puppy, puppy, puppy. I was so fed up with the word puppy that at times I actually thought I was nothing more than a pet to him. Then each night, he insisted on rubbing my back so I'd fall asleep more easily. Sounds nice, right? But no, it wasn't. He rubbed it really hard. And when I asked him to stop, he just laughed. Obviously, he wasn't doing it to make me feel better but regarded it as a pastime. Ugh! And that's not all. 
a few times, I'd wake up to see him sitting there, staring at me with this gummy grin on his face. Then, when I checked my hair, I saw that he'd tied loads of these dumb little bows in it. Are you crazy? I'm not a kid! I grumbled while pulling and throwing all those dumb things out of my head. But puppy, they look so cute. Tom always liked them. I glared at him. Didn't bother saying anything anymore. Oh, and FYI? Yes, Tom's his old dog's name. Okay, so I didn't need a genius to figure out that something was seriously up with this guy's head. But then, things got weirder. One time, he brought down food for us to eat together. It was fried chicken. And as soon as I smelt it, my eyes sparkled. I was about to take a piece when suddenly he pulled the plate away and took a big bite. I didn't even have time to react. Then he handed me the chicken thigh bone he hadn't finished yet. Help me with the rest, puppy. This part is too hard to gnaw. I rolled my eyes at him and flushed up with anger. Seeing my reaction, he said, What's wrong, puppy? Tom always loved the leftovers. Are you crazy? I screamed. Yo, I'm kidding. Don't you know how to take a joke? He grinned. Kidding? What kind of kidding is that? I've had enough of this. This place was driving me insane. I could hardly sleep at all because I couldn't even distinguish between day and night. Then, when I did close my eyes... I found myself tormented by the serious crime I'd committed. Josh was trying to save me, yes, but I didn't ask him to do that. I couldn't live like this. I needed to face the truth. I had to turn myself in. The next morning, when Josh brought me breakfast, I told him what I wanted to do. Expectedly, he got mad and glared at me. Alice, why do you want to go to jail so badly? I can't stay here forever. I have to face up to what I've done. But it's so peaceful here with me. Peaceful? Was he being serious? It sure didn't feel peaceful. Instead, I felt like I was playing the role of his pet. I lurched forward, but Josh immediately grabbed me so I couldn't move. I tried squirming my way free, but he was a strong guy. Suddenly, he covered my nose with a handkerchief and my eyes closed. Then everything turned black. I slowly opened my eyes. I was in the same familiar room, but... Bars. I saw bars! Ugh! I was in a cage! Then I kicked something. It was a water bowl! Puppy, you're so naughty. I can't lose you, so I've put you in here. He grinned at me as he handed me a sandwich. I chucked it away, then screamed at him to let me out. Seeing this, he immediately left and returned with a bunch of plush toys and dropped them in the cage. Hope they'll make you happier. Then he tried to stuff the sandwich into my mouth. Furiously, I took a bite and spat it in his face, then sneered while throwing the toys at him. Jeez, some of them even squeaked. Wow. Okay. His demeanor changed, and his eyes turned scary. If that's what you want, don't blame me later. Things were different after that. Each day, he only gave me a bowl of those gross-smelling biscuits, then he'd just sit there gawping at me. At first, I refused to eat them. But in the end, I was so exhausted that I gave in, even though I'm pretty sure they were dog biscuits. Ugh. I realized that resisting him wasn't benefiting me at all. It was only making him act more horrible. That's when a genius plan popped into my head. So the next time when Josh appeared with the biscuits, I smiled sweetly at him and said, Josh, baby, it's been so long since we've been on a date. How about you go and get us a bottle of wine and we can spend some quality time together? His eyes lit up. And of course, he agreed without hesitation. He hurried off to get the wine. Cheers to us! Josh, you're the love of my life. And I'm so grateful to God for bringing you into my life. Please stay with me forever. I flashed a sweet smile and whispered in his ear. Every time he took a sip of wine, 
I fluttered my eyelashes at him as I refilled his glass. To say I'm a Hollywood actress with an Oscar-worthy performance would be an understatement. Soon, Josh was so drunk he went cross-eyed. He fell to the ground before I even finished pouring him the last glass of wine. Seizing the opportunity, I stepped over him to get out. When suddenly, a hand grabbed my ankle. Oh no, I'm screwed! My heart felt like it was about to jump out of my chest. I immediately turned around, ready to fight him when, well, it turned out he was just dreaming. Phew. Thank God. I gently pulled my foot free and immediately dashed out of there. I climbed up the stairs to a living room where I found my phone left on the table. I quickly grabbed it and ran out of that horrible house. My legs trembled and I felt like they might give away beneath me at any second. But somehow, I managed to find the inner strength to keep on running. I couldn't use my phone as it was out of battery, and I was too disoriented to figure out where my home was. So, when I stumbled upon a police station, I walked toward it. I took a deep breath. This was a tough decision. I knew I was going to jail, but I couldn't live in creepy Josh's basement forever and be his substitute pet? No thanks. I had to face up to what I'd done. Sir, I'm here to confess. The cop looked confused and told me there hadn't been a fatal accident recently. But then he said I looked familiar, so he looked up my name, and turns out my family had reported me missing. That liar Josh had tricked me. It was all a ruse so he could imprison me. How vile! I charged my phone and up popped hundreds of messages and voicemails from my worried friends and relatives. This was all so overwhelming. I put my head down for a moment. Then all the memories gradually surfaced. I'd been in the mall parking lot and I felt like someone was following me. So I hid in the corner and that's when Josh appeared. So I asked him, why are you following me? Alice, I love you. Please come back to me. I rolled my eyes and started walking away from him. Go away, weirdo. We're done. Then he grabbed my shoulder. I shook myself free and ran away. When a car came out of nowhere and... Ugh! Yes, of course. Josh was my crazy, controlling stalker ex. So he must have taken advantage of my unconsciousness to take me back to his basement and come up with his bonkers plan. Then to make things even easier for him, I ended up with memory loss. Typical. <sighs> it was a nightmare. But thankfully, it's over now. The cops took my statement, and soon after that, my family came to pick me up. They all burst out crying, and we hugged each other tightly. It's taking a while to get back to normal life after all the trauma but I'm getting there. I do want to vomit whenever I hear anyone say the word puppy. Ooh. However, this didn't stop me from getting my own rescue dog, Lily the Corgi, and I never put bows in her fur. As for Josh, well, he was convicted for false imprisonment and has to stay in jail for four years. Who's in the cage now? Hmm. Serves you right. This shift was boring, so as I handed the two coffees over to the girl, I couldn't help but daydream about what to have for lunch. Um, excuse me, why the attitude? The girl sounded annoyed. Then before I could say anything, she shouted, I want to speak to your manager. The boy next to her tried to keep her calm and asked her to go outside first. Then he said to me, I'm sorry about my sister. I mumbled, it's okay as I handed him twenty dollars change. Oh, just keep it, he smiled, but then he started apologizing, took the change, then left. What just happened? I took out my phone to check my face. Oh, great. I looked like I was sucking on wasps, and all because I was thinking about whether I should have pasta or a sandwich. <sighs> well, to be honest, what just happened wasn't new to me, but it never seemed to get any easier. 
let me start at the beginning. So, I'm Isabel. I just graduated from high school and was soon to be a freshman at college. Ever since I can remember, my parents, friends, and teachers always ask me the same questions, such as, what's wrong? And why the long face? When I told them that I was fine, they would always be like, are you sure? Or, if there's a problem, you need to tell us, okay? Oh, it was so frustrating. There was even this one time where my teacher had to stop in the middle of a lesson to ask me not to look at her like that because my stare made her feel uncomfortable. What? I was just really focused. Then I eventually found out in high school it was on a normal sunny day. I was sitting at the bus stop with my best friend Jocelyn when some guy came over and asked for directions. I looked up and the guy got startled and began to stutter. Oh, so, so, so sorry for, for bothering you. And then he left in a hurry. Huh? This was so confusing. He didn't even give me a chance to get a word out. So I turned to Jocelyn and asked if she might know what the guy's problem was. Um, maybe it's because you look like you want to kick his butt. Then she told me how everyone at school thought I was an arrogant snob. What? That was ridiculous. Why would they think of me like that? I asked her this, and she took out a mirror and held it to my face. Well, see it for yourself. I took a deep look in the mirror, and oh my god, she was right. I did look a bit moody, but I swear I wasn't. Not at all. The next day, Jocelyn sent me a link to an article. It was about people having a naturally grumpy face, also known as resting bee face, aka RBF. You know the word. No wonder nobody likes me and wants to be friends with me. Well, except Jocelyn, thank god. She saw beyond my sullen-looking exterior. I wanted college to be different, so I was determined to say goodbye to snobby Isabel and say hello to happy, joyful Isabel. I just needed to smile all the time. Sounds easy, right? So on my first day at college, I walked into the lecture hall with the biggest smile fixed on my face. I hoped I looked friendly and not like that creepy cat from Alice in Wonderland, but then my smile immediately vanished when I saw him. It was the guy who wanted to tip me $20 and then ran off with it. Ugh, why was he here? I was trying to come across as a sweet, friendly girl, and I didn't need him spreading rude rumors about me. So the easiest solution was to avoid this guy as much as possible. Only the universe had other ideas, and I found myself stuck doing a group project with him. Ugh, great. We all sat in a circle, and I found out he's called Carter. Our group leader, Carla, assigned each of us a task. While listening to her, I tried to hold my smile as brightly as I could. Keep it steady. Steady! I thought to myself over and over. But you know what? Fake smiling is hard work, and it causes serious face ache. Then my cheek started twitching, so to avoid looking like a weirdo, I decided to take a break from smiling. And that's when Carla noticed me and asked, did I say something wrong? Everybody was gawping at me. I could feel myself blushing. Great, now I probably resembled a grumpy tomato. That's when Carter spoke up. Just continue. We'll say if anything's unclear. Thank you, Carter. Now, I know how Lewis Lane felt after being rescued by Superman. This felt even more intense than the movie. And oh, he was actually kind of cute, too. I felt a little bummed out. After the group meeting, all I wanted to do was make some friends, but I'd already given Carla the wrong impressions about myself. <sighs> I'm not a big party-goer, but perhaps the big freshman party happening on Friday would be a good place to make friends, right? Feeling down, I sat on the side of the bench by the college sports field and just looked up to the sky. Then I noticed Carter playing soccer with some guys. So I watched him play for a bit. It could have been the lighting, or the fact he looked so hot when sweaty, but I couldn't take my eyes off him. Maybe I should try talking to him. The next day, I walked into the lecture hall and spotted Carter sitting alone, reading a book. This was my chance. I could sit next to him and start a convo. Okay, Isabel. Keep it cool. Oh no, not cool. Cool means arrogant. Keep it happy. You got this. Smile on. Check. Hi, is this seat... Carter looked up. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know this was your seat. Then he gathered his stuff and moved to another table. 
What? Ugh, curse you, RBF. I wasn't giving up this easily, so I searched online and read that makeup could help fix my situation. So, I applied makeup around my mouth and eyes, then went to my lecture. Only during the group discussion, Carter whispered to me, Are you sick? As you look a bit pale, why don't you go home? I can take notes for you. After hearing him say that, I actually did feel a bit sick. Sick of the constant failure. But wait, this Friday was the party. That would be my last opportunity to make friends and talk to Carter. I'd never been to a party before, mainly because no one had ever invited me to one. Pretty sure they thought my grumpy look would kill the mood. <sighs> so I spent ages deliberating on an outfit, opting for a bright colored dress to make me look more cheerful. As I walked into the party, I couldn't stop shaking. Everyone looked like they were having a great time, while I just looked like a grumpy kid longing for their mama. It's okay, Isabel. Keep calm, I told myself. I just needed a couple drinks to boost my confidence. So, I got a couple of shots from the bar, and wow, I immediately felt like a whole new person. I was about to bravely talk to some girls when suddenly a guy came over to me and said, Hey, looks like you're having a bad time. If you don't like these things, I think you should just go home. It's okay. Great. If even alcohol couldn't help me, then what else could? I lost all interest in making friends, so I decided to take the random guy's advice and leave. Everyone would have far more fun without having to see my moody face anyway. As I hurried out of there, I heard someone shout, Isabel, wait up. I turned around and saw that it was Carter. He caught up with me and asked why I was leaving so early. I muttered out how partying wasn't really my thing and I'd rather hang out somewhere else. Yeah, I'm not so keen on them either. Can I come with you? I froze for a minute, but I guess he presumed I was angry with him as he apologized and went to leave. Oh, hell no. No way am I gonna let him slip away again. So I said quickly, Of course you can come! But it came out as loud screaming. The poor guy must have felt like a tiger was growling in front of his face. Well, at least he was still coming with me, right? Even if it was out of fear, he looked a little unsure as I led him toward one of my favorite places, which was underneath this bridge, but when he saw all of the awesome graffiti, he seemed to be more at ease. He had fun, looking from one piece to the next. Then we started talking, and turns out we could get on pretty well. We soon became close friends, and I even introduced him to Jocelyn. The more I spent time with Carter, the more I liked him, and I started to think that he liked me too. Don't ask me why. It's just a gut feeling. Then one day I opened the door to see Carter standing there with his huge bouquet and a cute gift box. Oh, sweet lord, were they for me? I knew I needed to say something, so I mumbled out, Who is that for? Ouch. Did that sound a bit harsh? Should I ask again? And maybe with a softer voice and a smile. But before I could say anything, Carter replied, Um, oh, these are for Jocelyn. Can you please give them to her? Thanks. He handed me them, then ran off. What? Carter was in love with Jocelyn? But hey, it's no shocker that good things never happen to me, and someone with a naturally joyful look like her would get all the guys. Let's face it, who wants a mean-looking girlfriend? This sucked. After that, I purposefully avoided Carter, and we didn't talk at all for a week. It was all too much. So one day after lectures, I went to my happy place under the bridge. What? There was this new graffiti drawing. It was huge, ugly, and I think it was for me. As in dried, dripping letters, it said, I love you, Isabel. I stared at it, open-mouthed. Was this someone's idea of a joke? Then someone came up alongside me. It was Carter. It's not my finest work, but I tried, he said coyly. Huh? He did this, but why? Then he continued, The flowers and gift were for you, but I thought you were annoyed, so I freaked out and said they were for Jocelyn. So afterward, I called her and told her the truth, and she said that you like me too. Now that explains the weird looks Jocelyn has been giving me. I was so having words with her later. <laughs> you know, I drew that a week ago. I've been following you every day after college. Um, not in a, in a creepy way. 
I just wanted to be here when you first saw it. And oh man, it was so worth it. Then he gave me the cutest smile and pulled me in for a hug. Oh, wow. This guy knew how to make a girl melt. And you know what? I was smiling, and I wasn't forcing it. So that's it. We became an official couple. Turns out he doesn't care if I have a RBF or not, as he took the time out to discover the real me. You should never judge a book by its cover, as you might miss out on the best adventure ever. So, if that girl or guy looks a bit miserable, then maybe you shouldn't rule them out as being arrogant and moody, and instead, give them a chance. Job hunting is so not fun. But my current job as a waitress isn't working out. There's too much standing around. I now have a blister on my foot. Totally disgusting. Ooh, hang on. This one sounded interesting. Retired couple seeks a well-mannered female housekeeper to attend to their country estate. Board and meals included. This job sounded like such an easy ride, so I called them immediately. And yep, they invited me over. So, this is their country estate. Jeez, it's basically a castle. The owner, Mrs. Harris, answered the door. She seemed friendly enough, and she gave me a tour of the place. I expected her to interview me or something, but in the end, she just showed me a bedroom, then said, I hope this room is adequate enough for you. You'll start tomorrow. My husband and I are away from home quite often. All you have to do is keep an eye on the place and play with our son, as he does get lonely. Huh? I didn't see anything about babysitting in the job description. But I mean, come on, how bad could playing with some little kid be? And who cares? This was the perfect job. They were paying me a high salary to do practically nothing. Not even cleaning or cooking, as they had many maids for that. This was over the top. Some people had way more money than cents. I needed to hurry up and move in. For the first few days, the Harrises weren't around, and I didn't see any signs of a kid. I mooched around the mansion and explored the grounds. Then one day, I was on the third floor inspecting a funny-looking portrait when I heard footsteps behind me. Startled, I turned around and saw a guy holding a teddy bear and licking a lollipop. He was looking straight at me. Okay, weird. Hello? And you are? I asked. Fred, he said, with a very childish tone. Huh? He was like almost 30 already. How come he spoke like that? Fred wants to play. He raised the teddy bear up to my face, like an invitation. All right, I shrugged, then followed him into his room. Whoa. It was like a toy store in there. He wheeled a toy truck over to me, so I took it and made car sounds as I moved it around. He clapped his hands and cheered excitedly. I ended up spending the rest of the day there playing these childish games with him. Then when I looked up, I saw Mr. and Mrs. Harris standing in the doorway. And beside them was a cameraman who was filming Fred and me. They asked to talk privately, so I followed them out to the garden. Mr. Harris started. Fred is our only son. Past traumas affected him. So now, although he appears to be an adult man, he still acts like a kid. Now that made sense. And too bad for him, though. The story continued that Mr. and Mrs. Harris used to work in the media. A few years ago, they decided to record Fred's daily activities, then edited them into videos to make a weekly series on social media. Wow. A show about a man acting like a child? How strange. The audience loves watching Freddy. Mrs. Harris giggled, but then she immediately changed her tone. But I do worry they'll soon get tired of watching just him. I think he should have a friend. It will help the show, and it'll be good for Freddy as he'll feel less lonely. I wonder. She looked at me all wide-eyed. Noticing my skeptical look. Mr. Harris jumped in before I even opened my mouth. We'll pay you double. Whoa, what a deal. I mean, it's not like I needed to be an award-winning actress or anything to be in this type of videos. 
Most importantly, that amount of money was insane. Only an idiot would have turned down an offer like this, right? So I started being friends with Fred. We shared toys, played in the garden, and did all those childlike things together. To be honest, I found him really sweet, and I felt sorry for him. Whenever he saw me, he beamed at me, and usually handed me his favorite toy, and that made me feel good. So, okay, the cameraman followed us around all day, but I soon forgot he was there. And I also never check out the final videos, as I found it cringy to watch myself. Then one day, the Harris's sat me down to talk to me again. Mrs. Harris looked at me as she said, You may consider Freddy as a child, but he is now a 27-year-old man, handsome and physically healthy. He likes you, and he has every right to date. Then after showing me several comments on the internet, they told me frankly that the views would be higher if I became Fred's girlfriend. So, is it some kind of real-life fairy tale? A kind-hearted girl falls in love with a mentally disadvantaged man? Jeez. But I'm not into him that way. I groaned, pulling a wry face. Darling. She touched my arm. It would only be for the camera. And it would make Freddy so happy. And of course, you'll be generously compensated. Mr. Harris added. Oof. That much money? Who could say no? And it was only acting. Besides, Fred enjoyed making the videos. Right? They must have had millions of views for the Harrises to throw money around like this. So I quit hesitating and agreed. They handed me an improv script and told me to do exactly whatever was written in it. The more convincing my performance, the higher my salary. Oh man, not long ago, I didn't have a cent to my name. And now I had thousands of dollars in my bank account. I could go to college, get myself an apartment, etc. A bright future was ahead for me. In the first video, I sat down next to Fred, took his hand, but he immediately started a thumb war. So I gave up on the hand-holding and softly said, Fred, I love spending time with you. You're so sweet and kind, and I have feelings for you. He let out an excitable shout. Then he pretended to be an airplane and did loops around the room. The next few videos didn't get any easier. When I tried to snuggle up to him, he'd whack me with his giant teddy bear. And when I went in for a kiss on his cheek, he pressed a toy car into my face. That was why when I read the next script, in which we were going to have a romantic dinner together, I couldn't help sighing and rolling my eyes. But it was work. So I put on a pretty dress and walked into the dining room. It was decorated with flower petals on the table, and there was mood lighting. Delicious? I asked while he was stuffing his face. He nodded, threw down the silverware, and clapped his hands. Fred cooks for Lynn Eats! Fred chewed as he spoke, spitting food all over. Man, this was so hilarious, I couldn't help laughing. Then he walked over to me and hugged me tightly. Oh my god, he got food stains all over my dress! <laughs> I looked straight into his eyes and thought, yeah. I did like him as a cute little brother. Poor guy. If only he wasn't so unfortunate. Suddenly, I felt his hands tightening around my waist. Stunned, I pushed him back and feigned interest in my food. A huge amount of money was transferred into my account that month, but I didn't feel so youthful anymore. So I started going off script and doing things that I thought were good for Fred. I used his toys to teach him math skills. I read him good books and I showed him how to make cupcakes. One evening, when I was walking back to my room, Mr. Harris blocked my path and scowling at me said, What the hell are you playing at? Did you even read this week's script? I tried pushing past him, but he grabbed my arm. You're causing our viewers to leave. I'm paying you less this month. I shook myself free of his grip and replied, Money? Is that all that matters to you? Then I rolled my eyes and returned to my room. That night, I ended up looking up the videos. In one of the older ones, Fred was in a suit and looked super uncomfortable. Every time he tried to loosen the tie or unbutton the shirt, a stick went in the frame and hit him in the butt. 
After a few tries, Fred threw himself on the floor and started having a tantrum. There were so many comments like, OMG, this is way too hilarious, and grow up, man, or don't, for our entertainment. Oh no, people were so mean. Fred didn't choose to be like that. The Harrises were using their own son to get rich by making fun of him. Poor Fred. I had to stop this. I packed my bag, stormed into the room where the Harrises were watching TV, and said, I like Fred and still want to be his friend, but I'm not going to be part of this freak show anymore. I quit. And if you care about Fred at all, I suggest you do the same. I expected them to beg me to stay or something, but Mrs. Harris just snarked. All right then, if you want to quit, just leave. Why bother making a fuss about all this? Girls like you won't be hard to replace anyway. How ruthless were they? I was fueled with anger. So I left their dumb mansion immediately and didn't look back. And guess who is cooking in my kitchen while I'm telling you this crazy story? Yep, it's Fred. A few weeks after I left, I answered the doorbell to find Fred standing there. Crazier still, he was acting completely normal. Turns out, the Harrises were neglectful of Fred, so he was raised by an old butler, like Bruce and Alfred. When Fred was 15, his parents ended up jobless and in debt. Fred told me, I wanted their attention so badly, so I started acting like I was still a little kid. But then his cute, silly actions meant his parents came up with their crazy video idea. They lied about Fred's age since he does look a bit older then made him solo act Dumb and Dumber on camera for years. At first, I thought this would be a good way to help my parents overcome their financial difficulties. But I soon grew tired of pretending, and they had more than enough money. So I told them to stop, but they refused. Then he told me that the night I left, he got into a heated argument with his parents and told them he wasn't doing the show ever again. I don't know anyone else, and have feelings for no one else. But you, he confessed, and whoa, turns out he's only 19. So I let him stay with me and, well, we started dating, like real romantic dates and a real romantic grown-up relationship. I still have a lot of money in my account, and Fred took all the money he deserved from his parents, then moved in with me. I'm starting college next month, and I can't wait. Meanwhile, Fred has found an online course and is waiting for the results from the new part-time job. Also online. Well, he's gotta hide for quite a while, since his face is all over the internet. But our future together is really wide open this time. Now, excuse me, we have a dinner date to enjoy. This is a real-life fairy tale, baby. Ma'am, sorry to inform you of this, but according to our information, Bella Hiddleston was reported dead two months ago after disappearing in the forest, the secretary said. What? This couldn't be happening. But that's my name, and I'm clearly still alive. This was some sick mistake. I asked them to check again, but they kept saying the same thing. Had I been missing for so long that my family actually thought I'd died? The accident had been pretty crazy, so I was feeling confused. I mean, what had I been doing in a forest in Cambodia in the first place? I tried so hard to remember, but I couldn't recall anything. Luckily, some local villagers had found me in a trapping pit and helped me recover. Otherwise, I would have died. I then asked the people in the embassy to help me call my husband and sister. There had clearly been a big misunderstanding, and I wanted to fix this right away. God, the wait was killing me. The secretary tried, but she said, Sorry, ma'am, we can't reach either of those numbers. This was unbelievable. I was stuck in a foreign country with no ID, no contact with relatives, and I'd been reported dead. But in a flash, I realized that I could borrow someone's phone to reach for my acquaintances via social media. So as soon as the secretary lended me hers, I went straight to my husband's profile. But I was so stunned... I almost dropped the phone when I saw his latest update. He'd just made an announcement 
that my funeral was taking place the following week? OMG! What was happening? How could this be real? I kept scrolling down his profile and saw my sister had posted an old selfie with him saying, Ronnie, I know this is a tough time, but I'm always here for you. We'll get through this together. Hang on, what did she mean? Firstly, I wasn't actually dead. Hello! But also, I know my sister used to have feelings for Ronnie. Did she assume that she could just be with him now that she thought I was dead? What a traitor! We were so close. Surely she wouldn't treat me like this. I had to get home and sort this out once and for all. I asked the embassy to help me fly home without informing my family in advance. I wanted to surprise them. Believe it or not, the day I was due to arrive home was the day of my funeral. What a coincidence, right? I went directly to the funeral venue, in disguise, of course. I wore a huge black hat and sunglasses to hide my face and sat way at the back so no one would notice me. There were so many people there. My family, friends, and even my business partners. It was so bizarre. And then I saw Ronnie. He looked exhausted. I just wanted to run up to him and scream, I'm alive! You can be happy again! But then my sister Kylie appeared and took his arm and whispered something in his ear. I froze. They looked close, too close for comfort. And then I noticed people around me whispering, Oh, it can't be that bad. He'll get a pretty penny from the insurance company for Bella's death. And then another lady said, Not just that, but a younger, prettier wife too, by the look of things. I wanted to puke. Ronnie and Kylie were hugging each other now. All of this made me feel like my whole existence was meaningless. Nobody here really cared about me. I couldn't watch my sister and husband for a second longer. I ran out into the street and kept walking until I couldn't walk anymore. Then I found a motel to stay at. The next morning, I snuck home after my husband went to work. I needed to pick up some of my stuff and get some money. It was so weird being home. Everything looked the same, but I noticed none of my stuff was lying around anymore. Then I spotted it. A big box in the corner. I ran over to open it, and inside was all my belongings. I was shaking as I picked up the wedding photo that used to be on our nightstand. I mean, I was barely fresh in the grave, and already Ronnie had boxed me up. It was almost like he couldn't wait to kick me out of his life. Ouch! I wanted to get out of there, so I quickly went to our bedroom to get some cash and clothes. That's when I discovered a shocking secret that made me fall onto the floor. As I was taking my clothes out of my cupboard, a strange piece of paper fell out, and guess what? The first line caught my eye was, Bella's death plan. It was a sketch, showing the path leading to a waterfall and made-up evidence along the way. OMG! This was it! I knew that waterfall! It was pretty close to where I had the accident. So, had Ronnie planned this? Was he sick in the head? What had I ever done to him to deserve this? I had to run out of there to clear my head, but something caught my eye at the newsstand. It was Kylie, on the front of the newspaper in an article about how she was going to be running the company in place of our grandfather. There was a photo of Kylie and Ronnie at the inauguration, and look how happy they were. They didn't seem to be upset about my death at all. I wanted to rip the paper up. But wait, why would my grandfather give up his position? He had never mentioned it. He loved his job. This didn't sound right. So I quickly took a taxi to his place to find out what was going on. When I got there, I was so shocked. My heart sank upon seeing him hooked up to medical equipment. Turns out that after he'd heard the news about my death, he'd had a heart attack. When he spotted me by the door, he was so stunned he almost fell off his bed. We hugged and cried, and I told him it had all been a big mistake. Gosh, I was so happy to see him. I could see he was tired, so I told him to rest up and I'd visit again soon. Then on the way out, I spoke to his assistant, Cody. I need a favor. Could you help me prepare a case against Ronnie? But suddenly, I heard footsteps coming towards me. Bella? Is that you? I turned around, and it was Ronnie. I didn't even have time to think clearly before he rushed in to hug me tightly. I could feel the tears rolling down his cheeks, and he seemed genuinely shell-shocked to see me. I was disgusted, though. I pushed him away and said, stay away from me. But it was like he didn't hear me. He just said, These have been some of the worst months of my life. I can barely sleep or eat. I, I can't believe you're alive. Liar! He was a liar! I started shouting at him, saying, Stop acting like you give a darn! You wanted me dead! 
Just wait until this gets out. You'll be behind bars for the rest of your life. Then I took the sketch out of my bag and threw it at him. Ronnie swore he'd never seen it before, but I didn't believe it. If it's not his, then was he trying to say it was mine or what? Ha! <laughs> Hilarious. Suddenly, Cody interrupted our argument and said, Calm down, please. Actually, I think the one who has been acting a bit shady recently is Kylie. Then Cody told us how, according to our grandfather's will, his inheritance would be split equally between me and Kylie. However, I was to be the one in charge of the company. Kylie had found out about this and had a big argument with our grandfather. And then not long after my accident, his health had deteriorated. Instead of letting him mourn my death, Kylie had insisted he transfer the business to her name so she could take care of it all. Then Ronnie said, Bella, it was Kylie who set up our trip. Then you suddenly disappeared. I searched for you in Cambodia for weeks, but Kylie persuaded me to come home because your grandfather was so ill. Then the police canceled the case, and Kylie kept telling me to file your death certificate. I shouldn't have listened to her. I'm so sorry. Stop blaming other people for your problem, I growled at Ronnie, but inside my heart, I felt like I couldn't breathe. Why would my sister do this? And then I heard Kylie's voice, and to prove it all, Ronnie told me and Cody to hide. And then he went towards her and said, Kylie, about Bella's death. Before Ronnie could finish his sentence, she gave him a big smile and put her arm through his. Well, now that her funeral is over, nothing is stopping us from being together. Right? Ronnie forced a smile. Then Kylie laughed and said, Oh, come on. Don't be sad. My jealous sister didn't deserve you. You know what? She actually had this whole plan to test your loyalty, but then she ended up getting a taste of her own medicine. At that moment, my head started to hurt, and suddenly some of my old memories came flooding back. The sketch. It was mine. I was the one who'd made the plan. It all started when Kylie had told me that Ronnie was cheating on me, and I'd believed her and followed her advice to fake my own disappearance to test his love for me. How could I have been so stupid? When I realized I was alone in that forest and she wasn't coming back, I panicked and fell into a trapping pit, hurting my legs and getting stuck. It was all coming back to me now. I couldn't handle this. I ran towards her and painfully screamed, How could you do this to me, Kylie? At first, she was shocked to see me, but then she just smirked and said, Huh, are you still alive? Well, either way, it's too late. The company is mine now. Oh, and so is Ronnie, baby. Then she just rolled her eyes and said, You were just the adopted child, so what makes you think you have the right to always steal everything from me? At that moment, our grandfather appeared and slammed his cane on the ground. Kylie, stop it. Kylie just sulked and said, Honestly, why would you give her the whole company? Then our grandfather said, Look at yourself, Kylie. Are you really fit to be running a company? Sort yourself out. You are a disappointment to this family with your dirty, nasty tricks. I couldn't believe Kylie was still using the adopted thing to hurt me. So what if I was adopted? That didn't mean I wasn't a part of this family. She'd always been so jealous of me, even though I hadn't done anything. Kylie started crying and ran out of there saying she was sick of never being anyone's favorite. Well, maybe if she hadn't left me to die, people would like her more. I was so shocked that she'd done this to me, and all because of jealousy. I won't lie. It took me so long to work through this. I still haven't forgiven her properly, but I guess it will just take time. As for me and Ronnie, we've taken over the family business, and I realized that Ronnie had always been loyal. Kylie had just made up that he was cheating because she couldn't bear to see me so happy. One thing's for sure. I won't ever be testing his love again. No more faking death for me. Really? You're from Korea? No way. You sound just like a native speaker. Richard jumped up in surprise as I told him I came from South Korea. Yeah, I'm 100% Korean. I answered him giggling. <laughs> I had spent hours every day practicing my English. Guess it has paid off. But that was six years ago already. I'm Jenny, by the way, and I'm Korean. At the time I was 21, I joined an online English speaking club where I first met Richard who never in a million years did I think I'd fall in love with, but that's exactly what happened. Ever since that very first class, we started talking every day. 
and the sparks between us were undeniable. He always mentioned how he wished I could be in the Czech Republic with him, and I found myself daydreaming about our future wedding. Okay, so I was getting ahead of myself, but he was just so amazing. After a month of talking nonstop, I realized I was probably going to fail college if I didn't start setting my priorities straight. But all I could think about was him. And whenever we weren't chatting, I was stalking him on social media. And every time I saw him tagged with another girl, I got so jealous. This couldn't be healthy. I mean, I hadn't even met him in real life. But still, we continued to fall for each other. And he even introduced me to his two best friends, Anastasia and Pavel, via video chat. But not as blossoming as my love life, I was failing miserably at college. I'd always been the one who laughed at my lovesick friends, and now I was no better than them. This wasn't right. Something had to change. So even though it was killing me inside to do this, one night before sitting down on my desk to work on my assignment, I just picked up my phone and blocked his WhatsApp, deactivated my Facebook, and all without letting him know. Yep, I full-on ghosted him. It was such a hard decision. Because that night, instead of getting anything done for the assignment, I found myself lying in bed with a tear-soaked pillow. It hurt so much. But I had to think about my future. My parents would kill me if I didn't get a good job. I couldn't let them down. Anyway, Pavel messaged me a few days later saying Richard had gone totally crazy and he'd never seen him this upset before. He barely ate anything and would drink all day. He's not much different from a zombie now. But I stayed unfazed. Bet he'd be okay, though. He was young and handsome, and girls were always after him. He'd get over me soon. And I'd get over him, right? If only it were that easy. I missed him every single day. Even though we'd been thousands of miles apart, he somehow always made me feel so safe, like he was right there next to me. What had I done? I'd ruined everything. Ugh. Instead of wasting time overthinking, it'd be better to put all my energy into my studies for now. Right? And it worked. When graduation came around, I was the top student in my class and even got accepted on an exchange program in Australia. Without even thinking, I texted Richard to tell him the good news. I apologized for disappearing on him and said it had messed with my mind because I hadn't expected to fall for him so hard. I had just needed some time to finish my studies, but now I was ready to reconnect again. Well, he'd seen my messages, but there was no reply. It felt like someone had punched me in the heart. Hours later, he finally replied and said, Sorry, Jenny. I'll get in touch soon. Now isn't the best time. I couldn't believe the words I was reading. I could actually hear the sound of my heart shattering, but it served me right. I was the one who'd gotten rid of him. He deserved better. But still, I stalked him every day online, and then I realized the only way to solve this would be to fly to the Czech Republic and find him. First, though, I had my exchange program in Australia. I bought a new phone and got a new number for the trip to leave my old one in Korea for my uncle who was always complaining about his outdated phone. Those three months in Australia were awesome, and I got my mind off things for a little. I was ready to start fresh when I got back from the trip, until my uncle told me that someone had texted me on my old phone, but because he didn't know English, he didn't know if it was for me or not. I immediately checked it, and there was a message from Richard that said, Jenny, I'm so sorry for my last message. I miss you so much. Your smile, your eyes, your voice. I hope you can give me another chance. Love, Richard. OMG! Months had passed since he'd sent it, and the worst part of all is that my uncle had read the message, and so it said seen. This was a disaster. Okay, but I had to focus on the positive. He missed me. Maybe it wasn't too late. I tried to call him, but he didn't answer, so I texted him and explained what had happened. He finally replied and said he thought I'd given up on him. I'd never give up on him. We then had a proper phone call. I am still thinking about you all the time. Why didn't you send me a Facebook message? The words tumbled out of my mouth in a rush, as if I was afraid I would lose contact with him again in any sec. Suddenly, he went all quiet, and then he told me he'd recently met someone, and that he hoped I'd understand and still want to be friends. I felt devastated. Why was it so hard for us? But in the end, there was no other choice for me. I just wished him well and hung up. All I could do now was move on. It was time to find someone else to date. Clearly, Richard and I weren't meant to be. My heart hurt, but I found a job and threw myself into it, giving it all my attention. Eventually, I got promoted, and after five years, I was able to help my parents pay off their debt. I even moved up to a management position. Of course, during this time, I dated a bit, but I couldn't make any of the relationships last. I just missed Richard all the time. I kept dreaming of us spending Christmas together. It was so frustrating. I mean, it had been five years, and we hadn't spoken at all. 
Why couldn't I just get over him? I occasionally went on his Facebook page, but all I could see was his profile pic that remained the same for years. I'd unfriended Anastasia and Pavel, too, so I couldn't stalk them either. For all I knew, he could be someone's husband now, maybe even a dad. And yet still, I never gave up hope that maybe we'd meet in real life, our paths would cross, and we'd finally get to be together. I couldn't stop thinking about this. And then three weeks before Christmas, I got a new following request on Instagram. I couldn't believe it. It was Pavel. And he was now married to Anastasia. This made me so happy. And he told me they were going on their honeymoon to Korea and hoped to see me. OMG, this was so exciting. I desperately wanted to ask him about Richard, but I was terrified to hear that he had kids or something. Anastasia messaged me too and asked how I was doing. I told her I was still single because I worked all the time. Hey, there was no way I could tell her it was because I was still obsessed with Richard. Anyway, the week flew by, and finally I was at the airport awaiting to meet Pavel and Anastasia in real life. They both looked so sweet, and I gave them the biggest hugs. After hugging them, I noted someone standing behind them. Oh, and gee, was that Richard? What was he doing there? I was so stunned I couldn't move. It, it was really him. Pavel broke the silence by saying, we brought Richard along for you, Jenny. Feel free to hit him, bite him, kick him, or whatever you want to do if, if you think he deserves it. Out of complete shock, I just burst into tears. It had been six long years of total silence, and now here he was, looking at me. I asked myself, could I hug him? But I didn't even get a chance to answer my thought because he ran towards me and picked me up in his arms, squeezing me tightly. Then he whispered in my ear, I'm so sorry, Jenny. Please don't cry. I'm here. I won't leave you. I promise. Could I trust him, though? I was still in shock as I drove them to their hotel, and then again later when I drove to take them out for some Korean food. I was nervous about hanging out with them all, but we seriously had the best night eating, drinking, and laughing. The next day, Pavel and Anastasia would start their honeymoon. So maybe then Richard and I would have some time alone together to talk about whatever was left between us. After dropping them back at their hotel, I was driving away, when suddenly I saw Richard running back towards me. He said he wanted to tell me something, so I pulled over and we sat down on a bench to talk. I listened as he told me that over the past six years he tried to date other girls, but it never worked out because I was always in the back of his mind. He said he'd spend most of his time working so he could save up to visit me or buy me a ticket so I could come and visit him. It had taken him longer than he'd hoped because his parents had got divorced and he'd been looking after his mom who was super depressed. A few months later, she was diagnosed with cancer and so he'd had to work even harder to help her pay for treatment. After three long years of fighting, she sadly passed away. And ever since then, he'd been feeling so lonely and sad. One day he asked Pavel to contact me somehow and when he found out I was still single, he was over the moon and decided it was finally time to come to Korea and see me. He said seeing me in real life had made him fall even more in love with me, which he hadn't thought was even possible. Then he hugged me tight and I couldn't stop crying. We spent Christmas together, just like I always dreamt of. And well, the rest is history. Here I am now, packing my bags to fly to the Czech Republic to see Richard. I can't wait to meet his family. And you'll never believe it, but we're even planning our wedding. The big question is, where do we live? Should I go there, or should he move to Korea? To be honest, it doesn't matter. As long as we're together, it'll be perfect. So it's true what they say. If something is meant to be, it'll be. Even if it takes a year or six. All I know is that I'm glad I had the patience, because I've never been happier. Oh, I've never been in a negotiation that lasted this long before. I've been here since three, and it's now eight. Worse still, I hadn't even mentioned the funding yet. I've tried, but it was Dane's fault. He kept on interrupting me and going off topic. As I looked at Dane, who was currently reenacting a soccer game with condiments, I wondered how on earth was he a part of the student council. He might have been a senior, but he was an average grade student who didn't seem to excel at anything. He also exaggerated everything and mainly just messed around. I should never have agreed with Dane to arrange the meeting here. Not only had I wasted five hours of my life, but it looked like the funding was a no deal. I couldn't take any more of this. Remind me never to listen to Dane ever again. I grabbed my bag 
and was about to stand up when Mr. Johnson turned to me. Ruth, I love your idea. Funding all of it would be a bit of a stretch, but I can go to 80%. And if it becomes a yearly thing, I'll be happy to continue sponsoring it. I stared at him open-mouthed. Did I hear him right? Mr. Johnson, the owner of the local music shop, was actually agreeing to provide a big chunk of the funding for our student talent show? By the way, I like this Dane guy. <laughs> Today's been fun. Dane wooed. Yes, it's a dealio. And enthusiastically shook Mr. Johnson's hand. Wait, I was supposed to be the one to close the deal. Never mind. We had the funding. This was amazing. We did it! Dane punched the air. Hey, um, how did you... He gave a Cheshire cat grin as he replied. Never expected that, did you? What do you think of me now, Ruth the new president? I shrugged and laughed. Hey, how about a celebratory hug, huh? He lunged at me with open arms. Well, why not? This deserved a celebration, after all. We were jumping up and down, and I don't know, maybe I was delirious from the stupidly long meeting or something. But the next thing I knew, we were kissing. OMG! We immediately pulled away from each other and awkwardly looked the other way. After that, he drove me home, in silence. Oh no, what was I thinking? Why did I, or anyone breathing, do that? It was Dane. Dane! Can you believe it? Well, okay, I suppose it'd been a difficult couple of months for me. As soon as I became president of the student council, my boyfriend Walter didn't congratulate me. No, instead he broke up with me. We'd been together for two years, but recently he'd spoken about marriage and buying a house. Um, not yet. I want to focus on my career first. But I guess me applying to the student's council and being all busy bee with work frustrated him even more. Now, I tried to distract myself with studying and council work, but I felt like I was getting ever closer to the edge of a cliff. One with hungry sharks circling the bottom. Ugh! And then there were the rumors being spread around school about me. Ruth's just a freshman. She won't be able to hack the pressure. And Ruth's so serious and boring. So I started working harder and harder to prove myself. Hence the talent show project. Only, geez, I was so exhausted. Both mentally and physically. This funding news was fantastic. But what was going on with Dane? Maybe he has some kind of secret power of attraction or something. Anyway, after that incident, he flooded me with calls and messages, even though I was crazy busy. After the twelfth call in a row, I stopped writing my essay and answered with an annoyed, What? Hey there, how are you feeling about the weather today? My name is Ruth, not there, and I don't care about the weather, I'm busy. Busy enough to correct my words like that? I don't think so. Ugh, fine. I agreed to go out for a quick coffee with him just so he'd stop bugging me. I stirred my spoon around my coffee as I glared at him and said, Will you stop calling me? I need to study. He stuffed the majority of his muffin into his mouth and took ages to chew it. Then he wiped his mouth onto the back of his arm and said, You do realize all the other council members call you Military Ruth, right? Try not to be so difficult and chillax once, will you? Wow, that sucked. I didn't expect to be liked by everyone, but I was working my butt off for the council so they could at least appreciate what I was doing for them. I cleared my throat. I don't care. Work is work. I didn't become the president to make friends. But I know you're not like that, Dane continued. You might be going through a tough time. Still, you're the most stunning person I've ever met. My face brightened up, even blushed. What did he just say? You're beautiful, strong, and independent. He reached out and took my hand and I tried to ignore the fact it was sticky from his muffin. Ew. I must be the luckiest guy ever to date a girl like you, Ruth. Those other girls are just jealous of you. I mean, you have this hunk, and they don't. Hold up. He said what? Date? I gave him a disgusted, who-do-you-think-you-are look. 
Reading my expression, his face dropped. Oh, I, um, thought there was something between us. I froze for a few seconds. Was I being too harsh? I mean, he was totally sweet saying those words earlier. Fine. Listen carefully. I'll hang out with you. Not dating. But you have to promise, swear, that you'll never, ever tell anyone about it. I don't know. I mean, he was so immature and annoying, but I guess he was also kind of fun to be around. He made me laugh, and I liked that. All I did was work, work, work. And perhaps that was why Walter broke up with me, wasn't it? Maybe when I hang out with Dane, I should practice being less serious. One Sunday, when we were having brunch at a random cafe of his choice, I asked about his graduation coming up that summer and his plan. Honestly, I haven't thought any further than finishing my freshman year, he said between chewing on his sandwich. How about you? he asked. Well, I want to go to an Ivy League college for a master, of course, preferably Dartmouth, and study social science. Then I want to work for the government, but high up, you know, like a managing role, and really make an impact, you know? Dane shrugged after I finished. Yeah, nice plan. And kept digging in his food. I felt weird. Was I being unrealistic, or was it just Dane's point of view? But to have a happy relationship, Maybe it's best to compromise and accept the differences, right? I snapped myself back into the now. If this whole thing with Dane hadn't happened, I would still be in anguish and despair. It was strange, but I did feel better around him, unlike with Walter. So I should respect his opinions. Gotta learn from my mistake, right? One day, I was at a council meeting planning a fundraiser for the remainder of the talent show money. I decided it was time people saw the real Dane. So I made him event organizer. But this didn't go down well. As in the other council members' eyes, Dane was a lazy, idiotic puppet. Give him a chance. He's the one who persuaded Mr. Johnson to fund the talent show. Please, we never know other people's limits and abilities. Then, this girl Catherine sarcastically said, Of course you'd know his ability since he's your boyfriend. You suck at leading. All you care about is your personal feelings. I know. I'll date you. Then I may actually get given a job I deserve. My tongue was tied. I couldn't find a word to defend myself. And at the same time, I was really, really mad at Dane. And worse still, he hadn't even bothered showing up for the meeting. Afterward, I went round to Dane's house and furiously banged on the door. Yelled at him the moment he opened it. How come people know that we've been hanging out? Dane silently scratched his head, eyes open wide, and stared awkwardly at some random spot. Answer me! I continued, but still, no reply. I pointed my finger at his face. I just went through a hurricane of rage in a meeting with the council to put you in charge of the fundraiser event. And you didn't even bother showing up. You better do an amazing job, else we'll both be dead. Then I stormed off. Over the next few days, the rumors continued to circulate about me. Clearly, Dane had been bragging to everyone that he'd managed to score himself a stiff girl like me. That I was no tigress, more like a lovely kitten. Now everyone was staring and laughing at me, and made meow sounds at me in the corridors. Someone even filled my seat in the council room with cat food. This was horrible to deal with, but instead of supporting me, Dane went rogue from school for a full week. He also didn't arrange the venue for the fundraiser, meaning we had to reschedule the event. I was left looking bad, so the teacher gave me a lecture on responsibility and strongly advised me to leave the student council. So that's what I did. Catherine's in charge now. After that, I couldn't face school. So I locked myself away in my room and cried as I thought back to all the things that had happened. First, Walter left me. Then everyone else on the council mocked me. Then I lost my position on the council I worked hard for because I put my trust in the wrong person. Ugh, Dane. (laughs) What he did hurt the most, as he was exactly what others described him as, childish and insensitive. 
I was torn between never wanting to see him again and also missing him like crazy. Now I had no one. I felt so alone. Ugh, darn it. Loneliness sucked. So when he called me, I answered. He told me he was outside my house. I guess I should at least hear him out, right? Hey, beautiful, listen. He grabbed my hand and looked straight into my eyes. It doesn't matter, okay? The council, the president position, those people don't matter. The most important thing is you being happy, and I'm going to make you happy. I wanted so much to believe his words. So I let him take me out. We ended up in this noisy restaurant with singing waiting staff. He found it hilarious, but I felt so uncomfortable. Then on the way back, he dragged me into this arcade and left me so he could go on the zombie killing game. As I watched him spin around and shoot, I realized how different we were. I guess I was holding on to him because I'd lost everything else. Who was I anymore? I felt like a stranger to myself. This wasn't me, and Dane wasn't right for me. He rushed over to me and excitingly clung onto my arm. Ruth, come see my high score. I shook my head and quietly said, It's over. I pulled my arm free and walked off. After that, I kept to myself, and at school, avoided Dane and my former council members as much as possible. It did hurt when I saw the posters for the talent show around the school, but that wasn't my problem anymore. I did receive a message from Dane saying something about his graduation party, but I skipped it. The truth is, he's just not good for me. Life was a joke to him, and as a result of this, he left me feeling like I was a joke too. I felt so lost. So I'm going to spend the summer with my grandparents out in the country, away from everyone and everything. I need time to heal, so when I come back, I'll be strong, confident, and independent girl I once was. As I really do miss that version of me. Each one of us needs to learn how to overcome things by ourselves, without relying on others. Especially when these others in question aren't any good for us. I want to meet Mr. Garcia. It's important, I told the receptionist. She looked at me confused and said, Sorry, but no one under that name works here. What? But he's the company director. The receptionist gave me this bewildered look, then firmly said, I'm sorry, but no one under that name works in this company. Maybe you've got the wrong building. Fine. If she wouldn't help me, then I'd find him myself. Miss, wait! You're not authorized to go there! Unfortunately, I didn't get very far before two guards raced over and pulled me away. As I tried struggling free, I yelled out, This is ridiculous! I'm your director's girlfriend! Suddenly, a smart-looking man appeared in front of me and calmly said, Madam, are you looking for Austin Garcia? Yes, I nodded. The man sighed, then continued. Austin did work here, but I fired him months ago. I have no place for someone with such lazy, carefree attitude in my company. I stared at this man open-mouthed. Oh no, so he was the director, not Austin. So, my boyfriend had been lying to me from the start? When the guards led me out of the building... I saw people gawping at me, and I overheard one of them say, Oh my god, another gullible girl got scammed? This couldn't be happening to me. Austin was my super successful, rich and handsome boyfriend. There must have been some mistake. He couldn't possibly have scammed me. Could he? I was showing my housemate Sarah the amazing designer bag Austin bought me when he walked into the room and slouched onto the couch. Okay, so what was with his glum look? Babe, it's just that my company has this big project on. I invested a hundred thousand already, with a five times return expected by the end of the year. Wow, what a huge project. I felt so proud to have such a perfect boyfriend. But then he lowered his voice. Yeah, looks like I'm gonna have to bail on it. 
I widened my eyes and asked, Why? What's up? I need to contribute another 50,000 by the end of the week, but I'm still 10,000 short. I blurted out, I can help? He shook his head. Babe, I can't expect you to do that. Besides, where would you find that amount of money from at such short notice? I'll borrow it from my friends or something. Don't you believe your girlfriend can do it? I winked at him. He kissed my forehead and then with a huge smile on his face, told me I was the best girlfriend ever. After I counted up my savings and student loan, I was still a few thousand short. So, I told a couple of my friends that my parents had been in an accident and I needed money urgently to pay for their hospital fees. I know lying was lame, but I'd pay them back soon. So what would it matter, right? But then a week after I'd given Austin the money, he showed up at my house looking completely bummed out. He told me he'd met an unexpected problem, and now he needed another $15,000, else he'd lose everything. I wanted to help him, but I had no one left to borrow money from. I thought he'd be understanding, but instead he just said, You can borrow money from a loan shark. Then in a month, we can pay it back. I gave him a confused look and asked him why he didn't get the loan himself. He stroked my hair and in a soothing voice said, I would if I could, Hannah, but you're a student, so your interest rates will be much lower than mine. Hmm, that made sense. Plus, we were going to be together forever anyway. So what did it matter who took the loan out? So that same day, I borrowed the rest of the money from a loan shark and handed it over to Austin. Hannah! A voice shouted, which startled me from my thoughts. Hannah, give me back my money. I need it urgently. My friend Rachel glared at me. I felt so flustered as I blurted out, Soon, a few days, I promise. She rolled her eyes at me. Yeah, whatever. Poof, I thought you had a rich boyfriend, right? Why don't you ask him to help you out? I forced a smile and repeatedly told her I'd pay her back soon. This was so embarrassing, and now my friend hated me. Ugh, it was all that jerk Austin's fault. The truth was that as soon as I handed him the money, well, he disappeared. His online accounts, number, everything, all gone. I even found out that the house he claimed to be his was actually just some Airbnb rental. Oh, and the designer bag he bought me? Fake! The next day, I was walking to my lecture when I heard two girls talking to each other. Hannah owes people loads of money, but won't pay it back. Um, isn't she always boasting about having a boyfriend? I lowered my head and hurried past them. This was so humiliating. I needed to figure out a way of finding that jerk Austin and making him give me my money back. Oh, who could that be? Maybe it was Austin with a perfectly reasonable explanation for everything. I ran to the door and opened it. Oh, it's just some strange girl. Where is Austin? Tell him to come out here now! She yelled. And you are... His victim! He tricked me into giving him all of my savings! She pushed past me and stormed inside. Austin, stop hiding from me and come out! I pulled the girl's arm and asked, Hold up, he also tricked you? She looked at me with wide eyes. Oh gosh, Austin's such a pro scammer! After that, we sat down and she explained everything. Turns out she's called Leah, and Austin scammed her out of $50,000! OMG, that was so much money! Austin is a real jerk! Suddenly, my housemate Sarah and her boyfriend Weston walked in. Hey look! I won this Tales of Suspense Volume 39 in the horse race bet the other day. You know, it's super rare. Weston was so excited showing Sarah his new precious comic book, while I forced a smile at them both, then quickly dragged Leah up to my room. There's no way I wanted Sarah knowing that I'd been scammed. Entering my room, Leah suddenly said, Hey, do you want your money back? I nodded. Of course I do, but now I don't even know where he is. She gave me this sly smile as she told me how Austin adored the Marvel Universe 
and that comic Weston had could be used to lure him in. So we went downstairs, waited for Sarah to go into the other room, then we asked Weston for his help. At first he refused, but then we offered to split the money with him three ways. Eventually Weston agreed and so, game on! Starting off, Weston posted it on a comic book marketplace for half the price it was worth. Only $150,000? Unsurprisingly, it wasn't long before that snake Austin slithered into his messages. Great! We arrived at the meeting spot super early and hid behind a bush. 30 minutes later, and Austin still hadn't shown up, and I had a dead arm. Ouch! I whispered to Leah, do you think our plan was leaked? She grabbed my shoulder and shushed me. Austin had arrived. He took ages to check the book, really carefully. When they finished the exchange, I jumped out of the bush and shouted, Austin, there you are. Where's my money? His eyes widened in terror, and he quickly tried to run off the other way. But Leah jumped out in front of him. She sneered and rolled up her sleeves, stepping towards him. There is nowhere for you to run, jerk. Austin was terrified and stepped back. Then I ran up behind him and snatched the comic out of his hand. Girls, look, I... He turned pale and immediately turned and hurried away. He even lost a shoe en route, but he didn't dare to stop to pick it up. It was so hilarious watching him hobble off. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leah. It felt so good to get revenge. Anytime. We clinked our glasses together. Girl power and all. Ugh, my head hurts so bad. Hmm, where's Leah? I guess she must have gone home. I went over to my closet. Um, where's the backpack with my money in it? I frantically turned my room upside down looking for it. Could it be? I called Leah, but there was no answer. That was it. Leah and Austin were definitely the same. Why did I have to be such a gullible idiot? There was a loud banging on the door, so I opened it. Two huge guys were standing there. Hey, beautiful. Pay us back soon, or else. Then they left. I freaked out, not knowing what to do. Find Leah and Austin? It's futile. I know it. <sighs> so I started working like crazy. I delivered newspapers and milk in the mornings, then waitressed most evenings. I was so exhausted, but I had to find a way to pay off my debt before I drowned in it. Then one morning, Sarah came downstairs to find me asleep, face down on my piece of toast. She gently shook me awake, then told me she'd got me a paid intern job at her uncle's hospital. Yay. Thanks, Sarah. You're the best. The first day at my new job went well, so I decided to reward myself with a bagel and hot chocolate in the canteen. That's when I walked straight past her. Leah! She spotted me, too, and ran off, but I chased her into a dead end. Where's my money? I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry! She sobbed out. Then she told me how the night that we'd been celebrating, she'd received some bad news. Her brother was in an accident and needed emergency surgery. Panicked, she took the money for his hospital bills. Are you tricking me? This is 100% true. She wiped at her tears. Hmm, maybe I felt a little bit sorry for her. But no, what she did wasn't cool. Besides, she could be lying to me. I mean, I did also use the ill relative's excuse to get money off my friends. So I dragged her to reception to check. Turns out she's telling the truth. Her brother is in a coma and the bills are obviously very expensive. What Leah did sucks, but she's all her brother has. So I guess I can kind of understand why she did that. <sighs> so it looks like I've got to continue working my butt off for now. That weekend, I was about to leave for work when I opened the door to see those thugs back again. They shoved past me and started picking up valuables. I shouted at them to stop and that I'd get their money to them soon, but they didn't listen to me. Then they picked up Sarah's laptop. Oh no!
no! Right at that moment, Leah showed up and demanded they stop right now. Then she proceeded to pay them what I owed them. Huh? What? How did she have the money? Well, it turns out Leah's brother woke up from his coma. They talked, and she found out his specific research had just won first prize in a nationwide competition. So he gave her the prize money and told her to pay off my debt. I was so ecstatic. I flung my arms around her and kept on saying thank you. Now I was debt free. Phew! I could finally pay my friends back and put all of this behind me. Huh? What was that? We both looked outside. Isn't that Austin? But why does he look so frazzled? Oh, turns out five angry looking girls are chasing after him. <laughs> I looked at Leah. Then we both burst out laughing. And that, guys, is karma. Ow. Jess, can we please take a break? Hmm. Fifteen minutes, okay? I'll go grab some Oreos. Our, Our favorite. favorite! Ugh. I hate chemistry. And it doesn't like me, either. The only thing I know is that cafe has two chemical elements in it. Calcium and iron. <laughs> My parents are freaking out that I'll fail it. I don't know why. I mean, it's not like I want to be a scientist or anything. Anyway, they asked Jessie to tutor me. Currently, my grade's still lingering around the F mark. But there's no way I'm finding a new tutor. Why, you ask? Well, because Jess and I are the perfect match. We're both addicted to online shopping and love to read about the latest scandals to hit social media. And that quickly turned us into best friends. And this is my ABCDEFGH boyfriend, Bryce. Which means attractive, brilliant, cute, darling, elegant, funny, gorgeous, and hot. I love him. So you're probably wondering how I met such an awesome college boy. Well, it's all thanks to Jess, really. As turns out, she's one heck of a wing woman. So one time during the break... Jess was looking up her college forums when I spotted Bryce in one post. Wow, that's a hottie! You know him, Jess? I pointed at the post. She then replied, He's so your type, right? That's Bryce. I heard he's still single. Go for it. I'll get your back. Oh, that sounds interesting. I grinned back. After that, Jessie went into full-on detective mode. After only 10 minutes, She'd found what block he lived on, what he's majoring in, and even the name of his pet dog. And since then, she instructed me on how to text, reply to, and flirt with him. Cool, calm, and collected. It worked a treat, as by the end of the week, he'd asked me out on a date, and now he's my dreamy BF. He might look like the bad boy type, but underneath it all, he's sweet and shy. Just like Edward Cullen. Aww. And guess what? We've been together for two months, and, um, we haven't kissed yet. But, so, how's it going with you and that hot college boy of yours? <sighs> I don't know. It's just recently, I feel like he's being cold with me. Jess, I know he's read my messages, but he still takes ages to reply. And he never texts me goodnight anymore. Not like before. I'm trying. I mean, he seems happy with the pair of Jordan 4s. And the new phone I bought him, but... <sighs> I'm not sure if he wants to be with me anymore. Of course he does, girl. You're a catch. He's probably just busy with his studies. I'm afraid he's... cheating on me. You know, there's this Sally girl in Bryce's class. I often see that chick following him around, acting all friendly and making excuses to ask him to do stuff for her. Ugh! Don't be silly. I bet they're just friends. This girl needed to watch out, as I wasn't going to let her just waltz in and steal my man. I slammed on the table. Seeing how frazzled I was, Jessie made a suggestion. We would take it in turns to follow Bryce wherever he went, and find out exactly what he was up to. A few days later, I overheard Bryce on his phone talking about his study group at his house. 
Annoying Sally would be there too, of course. So, being the bright spark I am, I paid the pizza delivery guy to attach a micro-microphone inside the pizza to spy on him. But, ugh, the only thing I heard was Bryce's hungry stomach. Yuck. Another time, Jesse texted me. Urgent. Saw Bryce in a jewelry shop buying an expensive necklace. Must be for Sally. Sorry. Fuming, I power walked the 20 blocks to his house. But his mom answered the door and proudly showed off the sparkly necklace Bryce had bought her for her birthday. Oops. Then, on one of my days to follow him, I decided to go in disguise. Um, the problem being, it was 28 degrees, so my choice of Sherlock Holmes outfit and fake beard wasn't the best idea. I'd just followed him into a grocery store when the world began to black out and I tumbled straight into a display of cans. The last thing I saw was a group of people leaning over me, including a confused-looking Bryce. Babe, you're awake, but why the freaky costume? I sighed, then replied, I'm sorry, it's just you've been so distant recently. Don't you like me anymore? He chuckled. Maddie, of course. I'm just busy with my graduation thesis. You know, I'm in my final year. Aha! So we were all good! Yay! So the next day, I bought us a set of those seriously cute couples rings from Tiffany & Co. to mark this. Peace was restored. At least for a short time. Lately, whenever we went out on a date, Bryce didn't pay attention to my words anymore and just had his eyes glued to his phone screen. Oof! He even chuckled and had this suspect twinkle in his eyes. So I tried leaning over him to see what was so funny, but I couldn't see a thing, as his screen brightness was lowered to the minimum. What are you doing? I snatched his phone, but... What? Wrong password. I bought him this and set the password as our anniversary. Why won't you let me look at your phone? What are you hiding? Nothing, Mads. I just like my privacy sometimes, that's all. Now, come on, baby boo. I'll get you a chocolate muffin. There's no way I was turning that down. Especially as thinking about it, it's the only thing he'd ever bought for me. But as I nibbled on my muffin and watched him transfixed on his phone, I couldn't shake away the feeling that something was wrong. I couldn't drag Jessie into this mission, as her studies were occupying her attention at the moment. It's okay, I can solo it, and this time I won't faint, I swear. I did my research and found the perfect spy software. I know, I don't normally condone this sort of behavior, but Bryce was hiding something, and I needed to find out what it was. The software was simple to use. I just had to find a way to install it on Bryce's phone. The app itself could be hidden, leaving me free to read his messages without him ever finding out. Perfect. Mission one, how to install that software on Bryce's phone in a really short time? This is not an easy task, as Bryce is so obsessed with his phone, he even sleeps with it. On a few occasions, he does move away from it, but it's for a few minutes max, meaning I needed to move fast. It took me a whole day of practicing to beat the three-minute mark. I tried it over and over on four different phones and at different times of the day to make sure it'd work under any circumstance. By the end of it, I couldn't bend my fingers. Ouch! Mission one, done. Successfully trained even under time pressure. Mission number two, detect his passcode. I didn't know what his dumb passcode was only that it certainly wasn't our anniversary. We went to the cafe, and as usual, he was stuck on his phone. So I held up mine, pretended to be playing games, but actually turned on the camera, and started recording so I could track the position of his fingers later when typing the passcode. It took hours. Literally. Bryce eventually gave his phone a break to order some snacks. So after that, he had to unlock his phone again. Oof. Finally, after an hour-long video, I've gotten the footage I needed. Okay, Detective Maddie, ready, set, go. I rewatched the video and started analyzing it as soon as I got home. I stared at the screen with my eyes following Bryce's hand movements. 
He could be fast, but honey, your girl is already a step ahead. It didn't take long till I figured out the digits. Easy peasy. <laughs> Mission 3. Action. What better way than a lovely picnic to complete my quest? And as expected, Bryce just sat there, phone in hand, the whole time. Ugh. I wasn't even sure on how I could carry out this task anymore. But I told myself that the time would surely come. After a few hours, he was bored to death. And without even looking at me, he grumbled. Babe, let's just go home. I immediately shouted out, No! Not until I... Uh, I mean, it's so nice out here. I want to stay a little longer. You just... take a nap. Fine. Wake me up when you're ready. I waited patiently for him to fall asleep. He was making these light snore sounds. Ugh, cute. I was so nervous. I bit down on my bottom lip as I gently pulled his phone out of his pocket. Then I turned my back to him and typed in the passcode with my shaky hands. And I was in! Yeah! I was so happy that I almost forgot and screamed. I did it all in record time. But he suddenly turned around! What you doing, Maddie? Can we go home now? He yawned. O-M-G. My heart stopped. Uh, oh, just a few more minutes. I'm editing the cute pics we took. Well, hurry up. Phew, that was a close one. I grabbed my phone to check if it worked, then... I turned on the silent mode ASAP, but it still woke him up the second time. As much as I wanted to snoop through his messages, I knew they'd have to wait. So we went home. Ugh! Talk about girl message overload. There were dozens. All of them craftily saved under names such as Monitor and Professor. He'd even used my pickup line on some of them. Are you made of copper and tellarium? Because you're cute. Ew! Then I suddenly spotted a familiar face. Jesse? What? My bestie was secretly dating my BF? My heart sunk. This sucked. It didn't make any sense. If Jessie liked Bryce from the start, then why had she encouraged me to flirt with him? Jeez, the messages between them went way back. Then I saw one that broke my heart all over again. Maddie's family is loaded. Baby, let's pretend to be her BF, and she'll buy you whatever you want. Just... Don't take it further. So that explained his shyness. Why he hardly looked at me, and why after two months of dating he hadn't tried to kiss me. Then, a recent message from Bryce to Jessie caught my eye. She's so boring. I got us enough money now, so gonna dump her next week. How dare they! Only, unbeknownst to Jessie, Bryce had dozens of girls on the go. Actually, he was meeting this girl called Tiffany at the movies tomorrow night. It was time to get revenge. So pretending to be Bryce, I texted all of the girls, including Jessie, to come to the cinema at 8 p.m. tomorrow. I borrowed my dad's baseball cap, wore my oversized sunglasses, and arrived there early, so I didn't miss the show. I even bought some popcorn and a Coke, as I wanted refreshments to watch this blockbuster. <laughs> then, at 8 p.m. sharp, Bryce strolled over, and boom! The girls arrived one by one, figured out what was going on, and started arguing with him and each other. Tiffany threw her popcorn over his head. Hilarious! And another girl called him a jerk and whacked him with her handbag while the others were shouting and pulling his hair. And me? Well, I lurked, in the background, and secretly filmed it all. Oh, sweetheart! You're so dead! Wow, Jessie, our main character, has appeared. She took one look at the circus going on in front of her and instantly looked like a lion ready to pounce. She stormed up to Bryce, pinched his ears, and dragged him while in a high-pitched voice he said, Ouch! Ouch! Jess, it's you who taught me all of this! I'll call you later, babes! When these two almost passed me, I pulled off the cap and shades and jumped out at them. Voila! Could someone come and help me pick up their jaws from the floor? Ha! <laughs> Couldn't expect Maddie the mastermind, huh? I didn't stick around for their explanations. Instead, 
I shimmied off, but I did send her a little souvenir. Hmm, Jessie is my best friend, so I have to share anything interesting with her, right? Have a good night, my bestie, and my ABCDEFGH boyfriend, you too. But let me add the IJK. I'm just kidding. Yeah, as for me, I've decided to give my heart a break for a while, as this has taught me a priceless lesson. Don't be smitten with handsome boys. Oh, and be wary of sneaky so-called besties.